Hey Cud, support strategist, by clouds. My head of the clouds not coming down, on AO3. Chapter 48, Warmth. Izuku frowned as he looked at his notes from the morning. I really don't think I want to do any of these ideas. I know! May scribbled something frantically and tore a page out of her sketchbook, clumping it and tossing it over her shoulder as she dotted things down again. Gravity Girl's new quirk is giving me so many good ideas. It's not a new quirk, Izuku rolled his eyes. Actually, it, it does kind of act like one, doesn't it? I wonder, Melissa giggles as she watches them both bury themselves in their notes. You can still change your mind, you know. Normally you would have already picked your projects, but today... Obviously, it wasn't normal. Besides, since Dad wasn't around this morning, you pretty much have until he comes back to really make your decision. What do you have in mind? Well, my first thought is to find a way to stop Uraraka from teleporting with support item or something, Isuku said, grabbing his laptop. But I don't think that would be very practical. And... Repressing a quirk can often make it more difficult to control, so it'll be best to just throw that out the window. Mm-hmm, Melissa said. I mean, I, I wouldn't know, but that makes sense. I wonder if you could make something like training wheels. May? Like to help her learn to control her quirk? I like the way you think, lab assistant. May giggled and wrote a few things down, then groaned. But there's a lot of mistakes and explosions between now and being able to use technology to impact gravity. We need to grow a few more giants before we could stand on their shoulders. Izuku thought for a moment. I mean, I know you already gave her the bracelet, Mei-chan, but I could always perfect this program for tracking her warps. That's a good idea. It would help her find patterns and where she usually ends up and help her warp more accurately. Melissa nodded encouragingly. And didn't you try to use it to predict that she was about to disappear in the car? Izuku's eyes widened. Oh yeah, I, I mean, the program is just tracking her gravity fluctuations and everything starts going wonky before she teleports, so... If I could run it fast enough, Melissa grinned as she finished his thoughts. Then she could potentially have enough warning to stop unintentional warps. You need a good alarm system, May said. Sure, you could always do an app, but that's no fun. And what if she doesn't have her phone? It would need to be small, portable, and... Uh... She trailed off as her eyes caught on Melissa, who started fidgeting as the seconds dragged on. Um, May, is something wrong? Is there something on my face? May's face slowly morphed into a terrifying grin. Your earrings. My, my earrings? Melissa took a step back. Izuku gasped. That's brilliant, Mei-chan. Melissa, you invented those to counteract panic attacks, right? How do they work? Melissa stopped and she slowly started smiling as well as she caught up to what they were thinking. They track a person's vital signs so they could send an alert when their heart rate or breathing goes to high. I've been brainstorming different options, but it shouldn't be that hard to just make them beep when the activation requirements are met. Good. Izuku opened his tracking program. I can debug this program and focus on giving Uraraka as much warning as possible before she warps, and Mei-chan can figure out how to make gravity sensors fit inside a pair of earrings. Mei's eyes zoomed in anticipation, and she made grabby hands to tell Melissa to hand over the jewelry. Oh, this baby is going to be so much fun! Melissa giggled as she took out her earring and handed one to each of them. You guys are really are a power couple, aren't you? Izuku fumbled on the earring and almost dropped it, as he blushed the bright red. Power couple? Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're not dating or anything. May's just my best friend, and, I mean, I know we spend a lot of time together and everything, but that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean... Yeah, I just used Izuku to help me make babies, May said distractingly, 
eyes already moving rapidly to visually dissect every tiny detail of the earring on the table in front of her. Lab assistant, get your dad already. I need to take a look at your gravity sensors. Hitoshi half dozed off by the time Uraraka groaned and blinked her eyes open. Ugh, I feel like I just puked a Skittles factory. Hitoshi flinched awake, and he almost fell out of his chair. But after half a second, he breathed a sigh of relief as he double-checked that Uraraka was here. She was safe on Gunhead's couch. She was fine. He chuckled and shook his head. Yeah, well, for all I know, you did. What happened? Izuku and Mei didn't give me any details on what happened. They just told me where to find you. We were all so worried about you. Uraraka played with a bracelet on her wrist that Hitoshi didn't recognize. Sorry, I... I didn't mean to scare you, Chigdig. I, I just... I was just stupid, and I thought I could just push it down, and then I lost control, and... Yeah, somehow I, uh, ended up on I Island. Hitoshi blinked. Uh, can you maybe run that by me again? Uraraka sighed. I accidentally bent time and space, teleported to I Island? Yeah, it's, uh, about as crazy as it sounds. Whoa. Hitoshi took a second to process that. Ah, that's one hell of a quirk evolution, I guess. That made Uraraka snort, and she shook her head as she sat up. Yeah, it's great. And what's even better is that I can't stay put because I can't control it yet. It's a real joy. Hitoshi chuckled and ran a hand through his hair. So, that's why you disappeared? And why I'll probably disappear again. Uraraka nodded and slumped back against the armrest. I feel like I'm turning into you. I'm just <laughs> exhausted. He gave her a small smile. Are you sure you want to add terrible sleep schedule to everything you've got going on? Ugh, no! Uraraka rubbed her eyes. How about this, Shigdig? You keep your sleep issues, and I keep my disappearing act. Deal? She held out a hand for a fist bump, and Itoshi returned it. Deal. Also. Where did the Shigdig nickname come from? It's not bad, it's just... Why? Uraraka chuckled. Ah, uh, it's dumb. I just wanted payback after you confused the hell out of everyone with your quirk activation requirements at the sports festival and thought a dumb nickname would be a funny way to confuse you back. She frowned. Not that I haven't done a bang-up job of that already. Yeah, you definitely threw me for a loop. But, but, whatever. Hitoshi shrugged. Uh, am I supposed to have a nickname for you? I mean, you have one for me, and I did just pull you out of a play tunnel an hour ago, so... Uraraka blushed and buried her face in her hands. Ugh, don't remind me, that's so embarrassing. Those kids probably thought I was crazy or something. Drunk, actually. Hitoshi pointed out, helpfully. So, what nickname do you want? Uraraka groaned. By the time Izuku and Mei called, Ajaka was feeling a little more like herself. She hadn't teleported at all since getting back to Japan, but she had a seeking suspicion that she probably would have if she wasn't so exhausted from two long jumps and all the little ones she made while I on I Island. She had the weird, worthy tingy feeling a few times. Whenever she thought about Mei or Izuku, or really any one of her friends that wasn't in the room with her, but she hadn't gone anywhere. So for now, she figured that as long as she stayed close to Shinso, there wasn't much risk of ending up somewhere she wasn't intending to be. That might change in a couple hours, depending on how much All for One hated her at the moment. But that was tomorrow's problem. Shinso's phone ran just as everyone was finishing up dinner, and he looked at the caller ID and picked it up. Hey, Izuku, how are you? Next time you send me a cryptic location, can you add a few details? Ochako giggled as she imagined Izuku panicking on the other end of the phone, but she stopped when Gudhead came behind her and put a hand on her shoulder. 
All right, you two, let's take this to my office. Her heart sank. And even though she knew she probably wasn't, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was in trouble. She had messed up. Maybe if she just had tried to use all for one earlier, or if she realized that her quirk was gravity manipulation, or if maybe she had better self-control than she had, she wouldn't have made everybody panic or by disappearing out of the blue like that. It was her fault that everyone had thought she'd been kidnapped or something. Despite that, she had no control over it. More accurately, it was her fault because she had no control over it. She dragged her feet as Gunhead closed the door behind them. All right, put it on speaker. I'm your hero mentor, and in order to help you, I need to go what's going on, too. Is that all right? Shinzo raised an eyebrow at Ochako, who took a deep breath before nodding resolutely. Gunhead was here to teach her and help her. She'd already learned a lot, even though she'd only had a couple hours to spar with him yesterday. And today. Well, today she was just had trust that he wouldn't judge her too harshly for losing control on her quirk. Shinso shrugged and pressed the button. Alrighty, almighty kidnappers, care to explain what in the world is going on? I mean, Uranaka should have explained part of it already, Izuku said. I explained what I know, Ochako interrupted, but that isn't really that much. I mean, I get that I'm warping space and time, and it seems to be related to people, uh, but uh, that, that's pretty much all I know. Gunhead took the phone from Shinso and set it on the desk. What we really need to know is what's causing her to teleport, and what we can do to help her control it. These kids seem to think you know what you're talking about, so do you have any advice? Can you tell me how to stop? Ochako added desperately. It would be really nice to just be able to turn it off. Unfortunately, that's not gonna be an option, Izuku said, sheeply. Until you get enough practice and learn how to control it, you're probably gonna be instinctively teleporting to any anchor that pops up into your head. Anchor? Shinso said. Those are people, right? Yep, Izuku sounded excited. So, I've been thinking about it, and I'm pretty sure how it works now. Uraraka, use your quirk on someone. If you don't just cancel their gravity, you basically change it somehow. We're going to run a few more tests with that part. But, that means that your quirk basically becomes familiar with the way gravity naturally affects them. And you could use that unique gravity signature as an anchor to warp to them. While training, you might even be able to use objects, but... That will be a lot more difficult since people are more distinct in weight, body shape, and muscle distribution. Shinzo rolled his eyes. So, what you're saying is that once she's cancelled a person's gravity once, she could find them forever? Pretty much, May jumped in. Well, uh, unless they go for a, a diet or get fat or something. Yeah, Izuku agreed. A bit of the function shouldn't affect things, but if their gravity signature changes too much, then you'll probably have a, to use your quirk on them again to re-familiarize yourself. Okay, Ochako sighed. So basically, anyone who I've ever activated my quirk on could be receiving a surprise visit from me at any time? For right now, yeah, sorry, Izuku said. But we're gonna help, Mei said. Izuku Kun has this really cool program that he's rewriting to help predict your jumps. And I'm gonna make some super awesome earrings that'll warn you when you're about to go poof. We're going to hopefully have them ready by the end of intern week, Izuku added. For now, it's clunky, but I could send Hitoshi an app that'll basically do what the earrings are supposed to do. And if it's a bad time and you don't want to warp, he could brainwash you and order you to stay. Will that actually work? Shinso asked suspiciously. No idea, May answered. Now come on, Izukun. Dr. Shields, almost here with the cryptic boards, and I want to have the prototypes ready with the... Ochako ended the call inside as she headed towards the door. It's going to be a long week, isn't it? Sure is, Shinso agreed. I'd offer to brainwash you the whole time, but uh, not quite there yet. It's fine, Ochako said. 
I need to learn eventually, right? And you're gonna do great, Gunhead said. That is what internships are for, learning new skills and doing hard things. And you know what? You have me and Shinso and all the other interns here to help you out, all right? Ochako gave a small smile in spite of everything. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. They walked back into the common room, where all the other interns were hanging out, only to see them all crowding around the TV and watching the news intensely. Gunhead immediately took charge. What's going on? There's an attack at Hosu, one of the mansards. There's, like, these monster things attacking everything and tearing things up. Monsters? Ochako got closer to the screen and gasped. That's a Nomu! What the hell is a Nomu doing in Hotsu? So, it's the League. Shinso frowned. That's not good. I mean, obviously, but... Uh, nobody hears from Hotsu, are they? Everyone shook their head, and Ochako frowned. I mean, wasn't that where Ingenium was... Wait... Ida's intern! Johto shouted her name, but she couldn't really focus on him with the way the world was shifting. After a moment, things stopped spinning, and she swallowed a wave of nausea as she looked around. Okay, I'm still here, I guess. Corkish option has its peaks, huh? Shinso glittered her. Seriously? You freaked me out. I thought you were just gonna pop right into the middle of an attack and pass out again. Yeah, Ochako chuckled. That wouldn't have been fun. Passing out sounds like a really good idea, though. I think I might just do that. Kyoto followed behind Negshot, storming the streets to create another ice shield as the chaos finally wound it down. His father would probably be pissed that he'd been regulating to rescue work the whole time, but Eggshot didn't make it feel like a punishment or a second tier of heroism at all. He gave Shinso permission to use his quirk, then went and saved as many as he could. Simple as that. No explanations, no complaining. Just rescuing any civilians who had been unlucky enough to be in the upper stories of the surrounding buildings when the Nomu was attacked. It was odd. Shoto was starting to shiver at this point, but Eggshaw had been told that these monsters had all been captured so it wouldn't be too much longer until he had to get back to the agency and warm up. He just had to push through it until then he'll be fine. He could do this. The building they were currently working with was close to collapsing, but Shoto's left side helped him steady as Eggshot herded all the people onto it. He gave the signal for all clear, and Shoto had to hold back a sigh of relief as he stopped producing ice. Just a little longer. He heard a cat scream behind him and whirled around to see Eper standing far too close to the ruined building to be safe. What are you doing, you stupid cat? Get away from there, the building is coming down. Eper just screamed at him again and took a few steps into the alley she came from, which unfortunately meant she was even closer to the building. Shoto felt like the panic was starting to choke him as he gestured widely for her to club closer. Come on, Eper, don't... No! He heard a crack, and his eyes widened as the building started to fall. A piece of wall broke off and hurled down towards the alley Eper was standing in, still screaming at him with no idea of the amount of danger she was in. Shoto didn't have time to think. He rushed forward, ignoring his father's voice in his head, saying that that love was weakness and that he should be risking his future as the ultimate masterpiece. No. His only thought was that he couldn't let an angry orange street cat die. He dove towards Eper, wrapping himself around her, and created an ice dome for both of them, seconds before the wall slammed down on top of them. The axe cracked ominously, cracking along the sides, but ultimately held firm. Shoto didn't uncurl as he desperately scratched behind Eper's ear. What were you thinking? I... You, you can't leave me like she did. You... I, I won't let you. Ypres was shivering in his arms, and Shota realized with a start that he was hurting her. He had been creating ice for hours. He knew he was basically a human icer at this point, and yet 
Here he was, holding himself up against her as she hissed and Meow's grew a little weaker. He hesitated. He vowed to never use his father's side in battle. And even if this was just a rescue, it was undeterminately a batter, but Eper gave another violent shiver and Shota's face hardened in determination. His left side with his father's side. But if that meant saving the stupid cat, he'd just have to steal it back. It wasn't his father's side. Not anymore. It was his. And he wasn't about to let that flame bastard beard hurt anyone else he ever cared about. He activated his fire side, careful not to warm up too quickly so sh he didn't burn her. And she basically stopped shivering when Eggshot squeezed his way through one of the cracks. That was reckless, kid. But it looks like you got it done. Good job. Shoto uncurled himself slightly as Eper started hissing again, scratching to be let down. I... I don't know what got into her. She just wouldn't come. Eggshot frowned and looked at her. Cats are smarter than we give them credit for. That one in particular, I'm pretty sure she wants you to follow her. Shoto looked down at the cat in his arms, who was still fighting the lead, and nodded as he let her go. Okay, lead the way. Eper scratched at the cold wall of ice that her kitten had made and hissed at him to go faster. She didn't know why he was so cold today, when he was normally so warm, but they didn't have time for that. His litter mate was in trouble. She'd been trying to avoid the chaos, she really had. The cat didn't survive on the streets as long as she had, if they were stupid enough to run towards every fight they saw. But she had been looking for a quieter corner to lay low. She caught a scent. It was familiar, at least a little, and she recognized it as one of the scents that always clung to him when he visited her from the other kitten he'd spent the day with, his littermates. But the other kitten was in trouble, and Eper couldn't do anything against an attacker with such big claws. Her kitten was strong, though, even though he didn't think so, and it was her responsibility to make sure her kitten was socialized correctly, and knew how to treat and protect his littermates. She had to get him. She'd been so focused that she almost put herself in danger, too. But her kitten had saved her and even warmed himself in the process, which in any other situation would have made Eep her with happiness. But today, she needed to take care of him and needed to take care of that other poor kitten. Her kitten melted a hole in the ice large enough for both of them to crawl through, and Eep her immediately shot off like a rabbit. Raving through the familiar alleys, only stopping an occasion to let her kitten and the babysitter catch up. Almost there. When she reached the alley, the attacker was gone and the scent of blood made her hiss and crinkle her nose, screaming for her kitten as she paused at his litter mate. He was still warm, still alive, for now. But her kitten didn't help him soon. She turned to look at her kitten as she pounded into the alley, skipping to a stop and gasping as she urged him to stop gawing and just hurry already. He just kept staring, though. A soft whisper escaped him as he stood, rose to the cement. Vita. Thankfully, her kitten's babysitter was more than a few seconds behind, and he was at least a little calmer than her poor stressed-out kitten. Grabbing at his ears and speaking to someone that he couldn't see. Paramedics, this is Eggshot. I need two ambulances to my location. Priority one. Oh, God. Oh, no, I'm tearing up. That last paragraph POV, I was like, oh, that's so nice. We get an Eper POV. And, like, Eper really does truly think of Shoto as her kitten. And I was like, this is so cute. And then I'm like, hold up. Wait, Ida. If Ida didn't have Shoto, and if Ida doesn't have Izuku... Right? And if Ochako was gonna go to Ida, but in the last moments was too exhausted to actually go, what happened to Ida? And then I get that last thing. I, I really hope, oh, I'm so worried. I hate these, not hate. It's hate as in the sense of like, not like loathe. It's a hate as in like my heart aches. Uh, my heart aches. <laughs> I... <laughs> I love these scenarios of like, what if, 
Like, what if Blink wouldn't have been there? And seeing how much that changes so much, like the domino effect and the butterfly effect are super interesting for me. And I'm, I'm, I'm scared for the next episode or the next chapter. I'm scared, <laughs> y'all, I'm scared. Uh, but anyways, as I wanted to say, we're halfway done with it. Halfway. <laughs> this is a long series. I knew this when I started this. This is a long series. And uh, it's one of my favorites. I really do like this one. And yeah, I love that Eper. Uh, I love Eper. I want to see more of her. I need more of her. I need more of Mama Kitten. And uh, I actually have a friend that has an orange cat that I guess has a similar sassy personality, I guess you could say. And uh, let's just say I... Uh, Molly and Eper are uh, the same same cat to me. So whenever my friend sends me pictures of their cat Molly, I'm always like, oh, look at Molly, look at Molly. And then I read this fanfic, I'm like, that's just the, another version of Molly in another universe. <laughs> but as always, make sure to eat, sleep, drink water, take your meds. Have a wonderful day or night. Join our community Discord server, link is in the description. Subscribe to see more of my content. And thank you so much for watching.